you know, we sort of think of both New Englanders and people from Michigan as almost Canadian. You're so close. But this is really your first extended trip to this country, right? It is. Impressions? Oh, incredible. Uh, you know, I, I came at a very unique time in U.S.-Canada relations a little over a year ago uh, and decided to travel throughout my uh, area of jurisdiction, which is the entire province of Ontario. Uh, and came away with kind of two takeaways. One was that business kind of happens organically between Americans and Canadians. Uh, and the second thing was this incredible sort of tech innovation ecosystem that Canada has created. Canada really punches above its weight in general, but Toronto, the, the sort of Ontario, Toronto area in particular. And we see that as sort of the future of sort of economic development and job creation. So aligning around those things in terms of public policy, working to build the sort of uh, workforce of the future, while not uh, forgetting about uh, those who, are, who have served uh, in these more traditional industries that powered both of our economies in the 20th century, that we help them transition with dignity to other uh, other sectors as a, a real um, area of focus. And I was just profoundly impressed by what is happening here in the area. Now, you, you've raised a lot of things. And before I lose some of them, um, I had heard that Toronto was one of the four major world centers for cybersecurity research, with 75 or so startups. And that number has probably changed just since we've been talking. What do you mean by tech infrastructure, I think was the term you used. So tech and innovation. So I think uh, around a lot of emerging technologies, uh, artificial inte intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, blockchain is, a one, uh, is one. And what we see is Canada really has uh, a capacity that is, uh, exceeds its... Um, what you would think its potential might be relative to GDP and population. So they're world leaders in a number of areas, uh, in, in areas that are of interest to all of us in North America, if we want to. Well, I, I want to test that a little bit, because especially Canadians of my generation are, are so happy that Americans know we exist mm -hmm. uh, or uh, realize that we've done something on the world stage that is noteworthy. I, I tend to think we make a bit too much of that, but that's just an opinion. Um, but if what you're saying is, is not just being gracious, that's really important, isn't it? So speak about what we can really hang on to as Canadians about punching above our weight. So I think uh, there are a number of areas. I mean, artificial intelligence uh, comes to mind. Uh, I mean, you have Jeffrey Hinton, who, who's the sort of godfather of artificial intelligence, who's right down in... Uh, Toronto, University of Toronto, so we, we work uh, with them and with the Vector Institute. And so, again, we see uh, great mutual benefit in getting the public policy around these emerging technologies right. And by that I mean really sort of uh, enlightened, proactive, forward-looking sort of uh, policy that doesn't sort of stymie or impede the development of these technologies, but also safeguards the interests of both of our societies. So that, you know, you need to find it right. And I don't think anyone would ever accuse at least the U.S. government of being very nimble and proactive and sort of prescient in these areas. So it's having those conversations, getting them right. Uh, and I th again, I th I've, I've found them um, Canada is a, a world leader in a number of these areas. So much good information. The people who predict these kinds of things talk about artificial intelligence, second generation, and robotics, and uh, machine learning being upon us in either a few years or a few decades, they aren't really sure, and creating a utopia where none of us have to work, or a dystopia where the robots are in charge. Uh, you, for a living, look at this and think about this a lot. Well, what's your view? 
I, so my sense is it's sort of somewhere in between. I think we'll see uh, the continuation of development of technologies that sort of aid uh, our sort of quality of life and business in ways that aren't entirely threatening to more traditional uh, jobs. I don't envision personally uh, AI within the next sort of 10, 15 years sort of obviating the need for humans to operate in the workforce. So I think there's that right balance. Uh, but I, I do believe that these technologies are uh, coming sort of um, into uh, commercialization, application uh, at a pace we've not seen in the past. And so again, it's just making sure that public policy isn't so far behind that when we get to a point where we believe it's impacting society in adverse ways, that we're not overcorrecting in terms of sort of regulations and standards, which has historically been the case. It's funny that you rightly cite that balance because in the early days of the development of the internet by the military, your military, um, there was uh, a lot of fear about its misuse and the developers didn't want security systems on it because it would slow them down. Yes. So I mean, sometimes it is uh, the, the very safety system or it's the very innovation that also creates some danger. So that balance is right on the money, isn't it? It is very much on the money. Now, if you'd have grown up in Canada and not America, you would have read Thomas Halliburton's account of Sam Slick, who was a clockmaker who rode a horse around Nova Scotia in about 1850. And Thomas Halliburton marveled that Nova Scotia wasn't the New York of Canada. Halifax wasn't the New York. No point of land is more than 23 miles away from water. There are rich uh, ore and mineral deposits and so on. Well, let's take this theory into your catchment area, Ontario. The Great Lakes must have 50 million people around it. Um, most of Ontario's manufacturing is a day's truck drive away from 80 million Americans and you say we're a leader in these certain areas. So why aren't we more prosperous, both of us? Well, I think we have the potential to be uh, more prosperous, and that's one of the things we're focusing on through this U.S.-Canada Innovation Partnership that we launched. We decided uh, up front that it was probably prudent to focus at a subnational level. And so what we're doing is uh, through this sort of province of Ontario and this incredible ecosystem there is trying to find ways to connect it to the Great Lakes states. Uh, and so I think that is where there's incredible potential to sort of develop that uh, economic prosperity that uh, we both seek. Uh, and I think we can do it in mutually reinforcing ways. And so we're doing a number of things, a number of them are exploratory. Uh, but our hope is to launch a um, Great Lakes Higher Education Mobility Fund, which my incredible colleague over here came up with a concept. And the idea behind that is that, uh, again, given that Great Lakes focus and that sort of STEM um, uh, excellence, is to create a um, fund that would be based on a, a sort of public-private partnership model that would stimulate uh, not only student exchanges uh, between Ontario uh, universities in Ontario and Quebec and the Great Lakes region, but also greater faculty and uh, research exchanges. And again, around these areas where we think we have inherent strengths, uh, a competitive advantage, and the goal is to sort of keep that advantage, those advantages. And, and those are in short, yeah, those areas. Well, I mean, again, it's uh, you know, it's advanced manufacturing, it's sort of innovation around uh, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, it's blockchain and things like that. So uh, we're trying to find ways to again raise awareness about the importance of a more seamless border, uh, both for movement of goods and people, uh, both ways. Have you ever put your diplomatic passport away uh, and tried crossing the border? I have. 
And even with my diplomatic passport, I've uh, had the pleasure of experiencing uh, secondary screening. Uh, so by Americans or Canadians? By Americans. <laughs> It could be that I was wearing a, a Boston Bruins uh, cap as I crossed into Detroit, um, but uh, I've had that pleasure as well. You know, um, they're all doing the best job they can, one assumes. Uh, some relish it a little more than others, and some overperform. But really, that's one of the, the tough things between our two countries is getting across the border. And you sometimes just feel that the terrorists have extracted something from us, uh, perhaps even inadvertently, but they have extracted something from us. You know, and I, and I think there's some validity to that, although I think there are things that go on that uh, people simply don't understand. A, a good example was we held, uh, we heard concerns from the uh, Windsor-Essex uh, Chamber of Commerce about this perceived thickening of the border. Uh, there and this sense that uh, sort of their fate in terms of crossing as an individual was really uh, at the hands of that individual CBP officer at the border. And so we um, hosted a DVC that included DHS representatives in Ottawa, the Windsor Essex Chamber of Commerce, uh, and others where we tried to demystify the process. Uh, and so, as a part of that, uh, I think one of the big takeaways was that no, it is not that individual CBP officer that has the total sort of decision rights over your crossing. They're actually interacting electronically uh, with a number of other entity, another of, uh, higher level officials who are looking into that. Now, elsewhere on the McKenzie site, uh, there's an interview with John Weeks, whose name might not be top of mind, but he negotiated the NAFTA on behalf of Canada with uh, America. And he said that uh, trade is up, but often uh, border crossings or the movement of goods across borders is stagnant or down. And the example he used was uh, 3D printing, mm -hmm. which may originate in one country, the good may be printed in another, and then it may be shipped to a third or something like that. So what is your view with all this new technology about um, whether it is big things like cars and railway cars and what have you, or is it something new that is going to, uh, in the digital world, that is going to be the key to our prosperity? So I think it's probably a bit of both, but I'm, and I'm not steeped in this, uh, but I see technology through the sort of beyond pre-clearance and beyond the borders that the U.S. is looking at. And we're trying to have conversations with our DHS and CBP colleagues and perhaps using uh, the Gordy Howe Bridge as sort of a, a, a pilot for this in ways that we can really leverage technology to both ensure the integrity and security of these crossings but actually do it in a way that sort of stimulates cross-border trade and travel for legitimate purposes. Um, I think 15 years ago I worked on RFID tags and um, that tag can tell you where every truck and every thing that's within a truck is at any given moment and you referenced pings a few minutes ago in the interview. It seems amazing that it is so difficult at the border when technology, including drones, uh, and remote sensing, which I believe we've had on, on the Canadian-U.S. border for 50 years. Uh, it, it seems odd that we have such difficulty at the border with such technology at our fingertips. Yeah, we do. I mean, so this is something I, I struggle with a bit. I mean, I've visited probably 20 cities, towns in Ontario in my first year, always meet with mayors, chambers of commerce, and this perception of thickening of the border does come up uh, routinely. Um, the complication is it's, it's mostly sort of anecdotal. There's no sort of hard data to support it. Uh, and so while I'm not suggesting we commission a study to look at it, uh, we do raise it uh, both with Washington and Ottawa frequently to say that there is this perception of thickening of the border and that it's in our mutual interest to sort of ensure that's not the case. Uh, we're both there to ensure that legitimate business travelers and transfer of goods can occur in as efficient a manner as possible. 
And I think both countries are committed to that. Well, with 84% of our trade with America, th there must be something good happening at the border, I suppose. Um, we are so keen to hear um, a distinguished diplomat say we do something well in this country and that there's a good relationship and you're happy to be here. And some of that is pro forma, but we are happy to hear it. It's all extremely sincere. Uh, we are happy to hear it. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say, what are the challenges? What are the things you want to get done here that are thorns in your side before you leave? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, there are so many opportunities to do great things and that we have to pass on a number of incredible opportunities that come our way because we simply don't have the bandwidth or the resources to engage. Uh, we're very fortunate in that we benefit from an incredible breadth and depth of partnerships with uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian thought groups, uh, thought leaders, and other uh, institutions where we have shared interests who approach us and say, we really want to focus on this, uh, can you assist us? And unfortunately, we have to be somewhat judicious and try to find things that are, have the greatest impact and are, uh, have the potential to be sort of mutually reinforcing. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I would like as well, we do uh, focus a lot on the GTA. And I've been out to uh, more rural parts of Ontario. Uh, and I, I believe that just like in the US, that they aren't reaping the full benefits of this sort of uh, innovation economy. Uh, and finding ways we can work with the provincial and federal government to ensure that this is happening not only on the Canadian side, but equally on the U.S. side, because we share many of the same challenges. So th those are more partnerships and more uh, dispersion, dispersal of the, um, uh, of, of the trade and um, prosperity in rural areas. It is. It was interesting. I spent a lot of time in, in rural areas in Canada, uh, particularly Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the reality is if you don't have high-speed internet, um, if you don't have experience, I mean, why would, um, say, an architectural firm download uh, schematic uh, diagrams to uh, Muscadabit or Shubenacadie and have them uh, worked on there if somebody's never done a project that size. So that's a huge challenge, not only technologically, but experientially for the worker. That's very true, that's very true. Uh, and so when I meet with mayors and chambers of commerce in these towns where perhaps they haven't uh, pivoted away from um, something, a, a sector that has been disrupted uh, and uh, they need to now find a new way to sort of create economic uh, opportunities, job creation, and things like that, that it's find, helping them find those ways to fulfill the needs of their citizens. But in a way where, again, uh, it's the sharing of best practices because we, we suffer from the same problems. Uh, we share the same continent. So the more we can elevate those discussions, share those best practices, learn from each other, I think the better it is for. Well, it would be uh, inhospitable of me not to say uh, if you have final thoughts, if I have neglected to ask you a question or raised a topic you wanted to discuss, uh, I'm all ears. No, I just think a great opportunity awaits us. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, we do have concerns uh, about 5G. Uh, and I mentioned them in my remarks. Uh, I, I know Canada is sort of evaluating uh, its position on 5G. Um, my only fear, again, going back to how integrated the economies are and how these new techno emerging technologies like the Internet of Things, blockchain, other things, it's, it would be, I think, uh, not to our mutual benefit if we were not aligned on these as well. Uh, and so we would hope that Canada would make the right choice when it comes to 5G. I think I'm um, reasonably accurate in saying you have more gizmos in America than we have in Canada, and I'm thinking of all the labor-saving devices in the home and in the car and what have you. And all those, ironically, can be turned against us as weapons 
and your wonderful Senator uh, King from Maine and his solarium project is looking into things like that and s mundane supply chain uh, issues. Uh, pretty scary, isn't it? It is scary. But I think we can overcome these obstacles together. So. Thank you. Thank you.